That's right. That is the password for the house. But what's the password for admittance? You see here, it doesn't matter whether you forgot it or whether you never knew it. We're covering the Faustian bargain, Arthur Schnitzler's dream story, Goethe, Johann, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust. I'm talking a little bit about part two here. And then also, of course, eyes wide shut. What's the password? Fidelio. That's correct. That's the password for the house. But what's the password for admittance? Remove your, yeah. So, yo, so tonight we're covering um, the Faustian bargain. And I'm going to uh, begin, I guess, by talking about Faust, by talking about Goethe's Faust here. Okay. Because what we do a lot of times is, this is kind of the whole reason for all this, is that we hear a lot about this stuff. We hear the tropes and we hear the, metaphors and how all these things come about and we often hear about the Faustian bargain all this stuff but very rarely do we go back and well we do but people in general don't out there go back and look at the source material so I thought I would go back and look at Goethe's Faust of course there was apparently a real Faust on which this is based and we've talked about Dr. Faustus ah Faustus metempsychosis 
Karate, karate. Knock this equi. Right. I'll headlong run into the earth. Marlowe's, Christopher Marlowe's uh, Dr. Faustus. But this one um, is later. And so one thing that's interesting, first off the bat, is I was talking to Matty a couple of days ago on his channel, Digital Minefield, and um, probably most people have the idea that Goethe came before uh, Marlowe, which is actually not antithetical. I mean, it, for some reason, it sort of sticks in our mind that Goethe is a medieval poet, but he's not. He's an Enlightenment, uh, neoclassical German a poet writing in, uh, see, Faust one was like 1803, early, early, early uh, 19th century. So he actually comes after Dr. Faustus. And one of the things that it says in the introduction here is that he had never seen uh, Marlowe's, Kit Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, which I find hard to believe. But what I'm going to do is um, take you through some of what the book is about, what the play is about, the epic poem. And, um, and, yeah, so uh, completes Faust two eighteen thirty one 1831, completes Faust in, uh, let's see, early 1800s. Uh, <laughs> dies in Weimar, uh, sad, um, but dies in Weimar on uh, what date? 322. Did you know that? Of course. Um, so, so I'm going to take you through some of this and some of the language of Faust because it's not really what you think it is. Um, it may, it may be what you think it is watching this or watching this later, but but first of all, the Faustian bargain is different in Dr. Faustus than in Faust, and it's actually a wager or a bet in this. And also, uh, Faust um, is uh, ha has to call in Mephistopheles. We're going to talk about Mephistopheles and what that uh, – compare that to elements of Paradise Lost – with uh, Satan and Beelzebub. And we've talked about Paradise Lost, talked about Paradise Lost so many times, and Dante's Inferno. But this sort of completes a sort of trifecta of Faustian or Satanic literature in classic literature. Um, not Satanic literature, but focusing on, on um, Satanic characters. And one of the things about this also uh, is that, that people don't realize, is that at the end of Dr. Faustus, uh, Dr. Faustus is uh, drawn into hell, right? He says he, he's, got, he's got no more time, and he's drawn into hell, into damnation, which is what we usually think of in terms of the Faustian bargain. But that is not what occurs in Goethe. Uh, in fact, Faust recognizes his faults and prays and then is forgiven. He actually does not end up in hell. And it actually has a lot of similarities to Master and Margarita, which David Patrick Harry and I covered. Um, because the Woland character even appears, the name Woland even appears in this. But there are elements of, I mean, there's elements of the Byronic hero, and there, there, there's so much in this poem. But what I'm going to do is compare it to some of the ideas of the Faustian bargain, which I really think Eyes Wide Shut, and especially um, the dream story or Trom novel, Trom Nobel, um, Schnitzler's short uh, novella here, really dive into, um, and that is there are certain types of, of Faustian bargains and there are, certain, there are certain types of hero's journey, especially when you have a normal, when you have a character, you have, um, some are born with greatness, some have greatness thrust upon them, right? Some achieve greatness. Uh, others have, a, have supernatural help. And then in, um, in Schnitzler's story, and in Eyes Wide Shut, we really have a character, Bill Hartford, who goes through a different kind of Faustian bargain, uh, which is one where he is, which plays into geopolitical elements now, and of course where he is blackmailed into a secret society, circles with, within circles, and he thinks that he is uh, at the top of the pyramid, but of course he learns that they're, they're, we keep getting levels up. Traum novel. Traum in German means dream but it's also, obviously, we get a cognate with, with trauma and the things that he goes through. It's a traumatic, sort of shocking thing that he goes through, but that he willfully goes through in this journey. And there, there are differences between Bill Hartford's uh, trip and, um, and uh, what's his face, um, in, in Traum Novel. But, um, but I'm going to take you through the various elements of this. And... 
Um, and we're going to see uh, how this goes, okay? Because um, I think it's important to look at the language, look at the form and content versus meaning. Let me take you through some of the introduction to this book first. Uh, shouts out to everybody. I hope everybody's having a good night, a good week, a good, you know, uh, spring. And uh, if you want to support me, you can uh, like and share. And also, I got the links up there in the chat and in the video description. Uh, I will be, just before we start, I'll be on um, Jim Bob's channel on Friday. And then I'll immediately be following that with uh, TNT Radio with Hesher. And also go back and watch Maddie's channel, uh, Digital Minefield, because I was just on there. We were just on there talking shit, as we always do. Okay, so at the beginning of um, Faust, we have, I'm going to read you some of the introduction here first. But at the beginning of, of Faust, we have uh, say, or Mephistopheles appearing um, in the court of the heavenly host. And it's funny because when he starts talking, um, the Lord says to him, is that all you can report? Must you come forever to accuse? There's nothing ever right for you on earth. Stop complaining. But let's talk about the introduction here. This says, uh, a man who called himself Faust or Faustus lived in the early part of the 16th century and left his traces in cities like Leipzig and Wittenberg. Of course, that's where Dr. Faust is. Uh, he's a doctor, a, a, an academic doctor, a PhD, um, an alchemical doctor. We see elements of this, of course, in Frankenstein as well. Uh, but that's where Dr. Kit Marlowe places in Wittenberg. We have the testimony of Martin Luther, for example, in the context of one of his table talks, incidentally referred to Faust, his contemporary, as a conjurer and necromancer who was wont to refer to the devil as his brother-in-law. In the mid-16th century, about 10 years after Faust's death, uh, Philip Melan Melanchthon, Luther's close friend and adjutant, spoke of Faust with a mixture of awe and fervent repugnance. Once upon a time, Faust intended to put on a spectacle in Venice, and he said that he would fly into the heavens. Soon the devil took him away and pummeled and mauled him so terribly that upon coming back to earth, he lay as if dead, but this time he did not die. There are other bits of documentary evidence, but while Faust's goings on are not ascertainable in detail, the legends pr proliferated and in due time began to envelop the scanty verifiable facts. Whatever contributed to the object lesson in the necromancer's reprobate life was worthy of being singled out and enlarged upon for the benefit of pious souls who lived in hopes of salvation. Magic and alchemy were related endeavors, this is from the introduction, and, this, and their practitioners inspired both awe and suspicion, all because they could produce near miracles in their vials uh, and retorts. They were, after all, in pursuit of ancient and persistent dreams. Transmutating base metals into gold, discovering the elixir of eternal youth, achieving human flight, finding panaceas for the plague, and finally the dream of possessing superhuman wisdom. There were reports that the alchemists Paracelsus and Agrippa had performed feats that came close to attaining those wondrous goals. Reports that, along with other fanciful tales, often became transmuted into Faustian lore. On the other hand, the alchemists and necromancers were regarded with suspicion because to bring about their marvels in the laboratory, they obviously had to resort to black magic and hence had to be motivated by evil purposes, much like the powerful evil scientist of our day as he appears in animated cartoons on Saturday morning television. Of course, it's a boomer. Always the cartoons. Always the cartoon references. Oh, gosh. Um, no, but you get his point, though. Right, you get his point. We have the mad scientist, and of course we have the priests of scientism. In the 16th century, an age of great religious turmoil and fervor, the alchemist magicians were seen as tampering with the divine order of things. And this is, tr again, transmutated into our own day. Thomas Mann wrote, the, wrote a novel about uh, Dr. Uh, Faustus. Uh, Dr. Faustus, 1947, he has the narrator play on the common root in the German word uh, ver 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 versichen. I don't know this word, meaning to try or test. Versuch. And then it says, surely, forgive me, German speakers, uh, surely, where there's temptation, the devil or Mephistopheles cannot be far behind. After all, Jesus himself, having been led into the wilderness by the evil spirit, had to confront three temptations, and three times he stood fast against their lure, Luke 4. Uh, there were stories circulating about Faust. But then let's go on to Goethe. Um, it says here, to the 18th century, however, the interpretation of the Faust story in the dim light of old biases and medieval superstitions must have seemed quaintly picturesque, superannuated, and irrelevant to the sensibilities of modern man because this is, this is the Enlightenment. Right? This is Enlightenment going into post-Enlightenment neoclassical era. So, of course, he's going to say this. 
Faust chafing at his human limitations could no longer in itself be regarded as sinful. <laughs> okay. A new pride in the great. This is, this is, Faust and Eyes Wide Shut and all of these books that we talk about usually deal with hubris and with, of course, pride, right? Hubris in the sense that Dr. Faustus thinks, Dr. Faustus or Faust thinks that, uh, he can win a wager. He can, he can, there's nothing that will shock him. There was, there's nothing in the world that he can learn. He knows everything. Um, until finally he learns uh, humility and kindness. Uh, he learns um, to care for someone other than himself, which is sort of the lesson of the whole thing. But then it says, and I'm, I'm it's sort of a glib statement or, or simplistic, but it sort of boils down to that. It says, indeed, at the, uh, at the end of the second part of Goethe's drama, Faust has earned the right to divine grace, right? Um, a new pride in the grandeur of the individual fed by re- rekindled confidence in the capacity of human reason to unravel nature's mysteries made it possible to see in Faust not only the sinner, but also a representative example of what is noble and divine in man, an unquenchable thirst for knowledge and an inborn need to explore by spiritual as well as sensuous means, the limits of human potential, the human potential movement. Uh, this talks about Goethe's life, which I'm going to kind of skip here. Uh, in 1773, he was a 24-year-old 20, 20, law student. There's why, that's why there's law peppered in uh, throughout Faust and uh, legal references here. It says, um, in his long life as a scholar, Faust had reached the melancholy conclusion that he would never know what is truly worth knowing, that he would be blinded by the light of truth and must therefore be resigned to live with mere reflections and counterfeit Images, since he has little faith in even the devil's ability to satisfy his craving to the full, he is confident, though by no means cheerfully so, that he will win the bet. It, it's <laughs> one thing that's interesting is <clears throat> the differences between these these two works, Marlowe's work and Goethe's work. Is that Marlowe's work? You know, if I were dramatizing the work, if I were putting on a production, I would concern myself with the fact that his motivation, Doctor Faustus's motivation, is to uh, experience 24 years of what it means to be the, the wisest man in the world, to learn everything that he can, to, to, to be the font of wisdom, and then uh, finally to, uh, to fall in love with the woman that he does. But Faust is different because Faust truly wants to transcend. He wants an apotheosis where he can be a god. And, of course, by transcending the heights of wisdom, he actually – because it's devilish wisdom, he actually, it's inverted, and he falls into the depths of creeperdom, which is actually in the, in the play. Um, he falls in love with, falls in love, falls in lust with a girl named Gretchen and uh, seduces her. She's a, you know, pure, he's a creep. He's a, he's a creep. He falls in love with her, um, or lust, and then he abandons her, and then she, um, she gets pregas, and then unalives herself and her child and um, is she's whipped and scorned uh, by the by the village uh, before she unalives herself and then she dies and then she is um, kind of sentenced to rot but she's given grace because she she asked forgiveness for what she's done she's been seduced and she doesn't she doesn't really know by this guy and then uh, Faust sees her in pain with uh, Mephistopheles. And even, Mephist- even Mephistopheles in the play uh, tries to appeal to Faust's sense of dignity and, and kindness, and he's unable to at that point. Um, but it shows you the, the depths to which he's sort of penetrating. He, and, 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 and Faust thinks that he, he, it's funny because he's an alchemist, and he's using uh, spiritual warfare, and he's a scientismic priest, and he's trying to turn his baseness into gold, right? Not his basedness. Um, but he also scorns divinity, even though he invites in Mephistopheles and he, uh, and he is tempted by him. Tempted in a different sort of way than in Dr. Faustus. But what's really interesting, which I'm going to get to, is, is some of the rituals in this play and how much they relate to Things like there's Macbethian language, obviously, because Macbeth, 
Macbeth and uh, K- King James himself, his, D- his book Demonology, 1547, sort of set the stage for Western, especially English literature, in dealing with these things, with, with the occult. Um, it says, I'm going to skip forward here. It says, um, it says, uh, and there's uh, elements of the Goetia here. There's certainly Crowley and Crowley. The Crowleyan and uh, Crowleyan sex magic and Thelema certainly play a part in Eyes Wide Shut and in uh, in Schnitzler. It says um, a momentous Goetian um, Gertie, sorry Gertian departure from the old legend occurred in Goethe's version of the transaction between Faust and Mephistopheles. The traditional twenty four year contract was done away with with trans and transformed into a wager. Faust says to Mephisto, uh, and that's one of the the pictures that I put up at the beginning is a, a film that probably not many have seen called Mephisto about a an actor um, during the Weimar era who uh, makes a deal with the uh, with the Zanies and with Goering and then achieves height and fame, but he plays the character Mephisto. Um, it's a uh, what's that guy's name? Um, Rainer, not not Rilke. Uh, I can't remember the actor's name. Um, uh, it says the tradition. Uh, Faust says to Mephisto, if, "If ever I should tell the moment, oh stay, you are so beautiful, then you may cast me into chains. Then I shall smile upon perdition," which is a Paradise Lost language. It's that's almost purely Paradise Lost Miltonian language in the adamantine chains. In his long life as a scholar, Faust had reached the melancholy conclusion that he will never know what is truly worth knowing, that he would be blinded by the light of truth and must therefore be resigned to live with more, mere reflections and counterfeit images. He's little faith in the devil's ability to satisfy his craving to full. He fully expects, fully expects that he will continue to live as he lived before and truly advancing beyond the, the condition that made him uh, say in the opening monologue, yet here I am, a wretched fool, no wiser than I was before. I don't pretend to know a thing worth knowing. I don't pretend that I can teach. In lines 358 to 372. Faust's prospects are dim and grim. Despair and the idea of unaliving himself are even his close companions. But suppose that Faust were to lose the wager and that through Mephisto's machinations, he indeed were to experience the supreme moment, capitalized supreme moment, the incomparable, all-encompassing pinprick of time. In that case, for a single instant of usurped divinity, Faust would look upon even hellfire as trivial punishment. The stakes of the wager, no doubt by design, are not what they seem to be at first sight. They require speculation in the alchemical sense, meaning intellectual probing and testing. As it turns out, an accounting of who won or who lost is not finally an issue in Faust. All is secondary to the quest for the transcendent capital M moment. It is Faust's irrepressible striving to extend the human potential and to break through the restrictions inherent in human nature that finally tips the balance in favor of Faust's salvation, even though in legalistic terms he may have lost his bet with Mephisto. And then skipping forward here, uh, I was talking about the moods and modes and the variations in Goethe's text, uh, which I'm going to kind of, even though we usually go into this, I'm going to kind of gloss over because it's German. But he does, but I will say that one of the things about the form and content here that's pretty unique about, and the reason that Goethe is so famous, especially with Faust, is that he um, he mirrors by reflection his form in terms of the eon in which he's writing. Uh, which about which he's writing. So, for instance, like he's using sort of Latin Latinate hexameters when he's talking about in Book Two about um, the Homeric era, and then of course, of course, about uh, Helen of Troy. And then he, there's Book Two is also in sort of heroic couplets of the the heroic couplets of the neoclassical era. But there's a lot of varying imagery and form especially in terms of the Valpurgisnacht scene and the Br- the Brocken of uh, Valpurgisnacht in book one. And those are scenes that mirror both later um, Master and Margarita and prior to that, uh, the, the uh, witch's brew scene in Macbeth. Remember that in Macbeth, <laughs> when, when Macbeth goes to make his deal, he also wants the same thing that Faust wants, which is he wants... Uh, wisdom. He wants the wisdom, or rather the knowledge, to know uh, how he's going to live and and how long he's going to reign, right? And then he's told that basically he's not going to reign. Um, he's not because he's not. He will reign, but he won't have children, right? And that uh, Banquo will not reign, but his children will reign. And he sees what the, will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? But in that scene, 
when he meets with the witches, uh, the the language uh, transfers from the ordinary iambic pentameter to an inverted syntax and an inverted line. So it turns into kind of uh, like trochaic, what is it? Uh, trochaic trimeter. It's like six, six syllable lines with the ordinary form. Everything's in basically every, just for the layman, everything is inverted. So the normal run of things gets switched because the witches are sort of, in a, in a sense, backmasking. And remember, that's going to play a part in Eyes Wide Shut when Bill walks into the ritual and Nick Nightingale is playing the song, which is, a, a, I think, a form of, or, it's, a, it's, it's Orthodox liturgy, but it's backmasked. It's played backwards. It's that Jocelyn Pook song. Um, I mean, it's it's a satanic uh, it's a satanic ceremony. It's clearly that when he walks in, and you've got the uh, red priest, you know, with the censer, right, and the incense, and the six, you know, half naked women in masks. The the fact that everyone is masked by itself. Um, is indicative of the fact that society and the 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 rulers of society and the pyramid structure, it do, in a sense, it doesn't. They're masked characters because we never see their deeds. And even in the ceremony, the inverted liturgy in which we see them, the the satanic ceremony, um, they're still masked because their identities. And in fact, it it doesn't even matter at this point that whether they have identities or not. They're totally soaked into something demonic. Um, it says, while a uh, diversity of approaches to the Faust poem have over the approximately century and a half of its existence produced incredible insights, critics with an all-too-single-minded perspective tended to obscure values that are accessible only to a different optic. The poem's philosophical problems, for example, those having to do with the nature of truth and of cosmic government, governance, have been explored perhaps more intently than, uh, intensively than any other aspect. Psychological analyses of the characters have been carried out, as well as researchers dealing exclusively with the rich field of Faustian imagery. Now, that deals with the sense that Faust is appealing to, in a, in a, in a Freudian psychological sense, to his higher self. And whether he's in a psycho, it really in a psychopathic sense, whether, whether he is able to become the god of himself by appealing to that higher self. Uh, we are fortunate in having comparative studies dealing with literary and spiritual influences that went into the composition of both parts of the poem. A considerable body of evidence also has been marshaled into support in the propos proposition that a far-reaching analogy exists between Goethe's vision of life forms and the Earth's flora um, and the principles governing the structure of Faust. When all is said and done, however, the simple question is what, what is Faust is about is still capable of eliciting fresh responses if only for the reason that by Looking for meaning, we are implicitly searching for some underlying coherence or a metaphor that might convincingly convey a sense of structure. To find textual confirmation or for one's own intuited, let's see, intuited image of unity in Faust is the exhilarating reward of devoted study. Certainly, even after only a fleeting acquaintance, one must ask the question, what is it that keeps Faust dissatisfied, even though he has mastered all the academic disciplines of his day? Why can he not be proud of his accompli accomplishments and have faith in human progress like his redoubtable assistant, Wagner. He's got an assistant named Wagner. At least part of the answer may be found in the most concentrated symbol of Faust's imperious need, the all-encompassing moment, the Augenblick, that is the subject of the wager with Mephisto and the thematic undercurrent of the entire drama. To experience in a single instant the succession of events that mark our existence in time is equivalent to eliminating time altogether. It means an existence in a continuous present tense. As temporal creatures nervously feeding a uh, shortening future into a lengthening past, we attribute to the gods a timeless mode of being and an existence in total simultaneity. Therefore, Faust's craving for the highest moment really amounts to the ultimate hubris, what I just said. He is reaching for more than mere superiority among men, more than Macbeth, who would be king, and more than Oedipus, the incomparable solver of riddles who was the king and came to know it too late. Faust reaches for divinity, divinity and is hell-bent to burst out of his imprisonment in temporality. So there you go. That's 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 pretty much the point of Faust. Um, but yeah, it begins with uh, the wager in heaven. Uh, Mephistopheles. It begins with um, Raphael, Ga uh, Gabriel, and Michael 
appearing as a sort of chorus and then appearing before the Lord. And then Mephistopheles occur, uh, appears. And he basically says, you know, I can tempt him. Um, the Lord says, very well, I leave this much to you. Draw this spirit from this primal source. And if you can hold him, lead him downward on your road. But stand ashamed when in the end you must confess a good man in his dark and secret longings is well aware which path to go. And that he's proven, of course, God has proven right at the end of this. Um, but it's interesting because at the beginning of the first part of the tragedy um, in Faust's study, a high vaulted narrow gothic room, Faust wrestles in an armchair at his desk. He's sitting there and he, he, ought to, he right away starts to give the sort of rankings of, of uh, Setian and uh, Satanic hierarchy. They call me Magister, even Doctor. And for some 10 years now, I've led students by the nose, up and down, across and in circles. All I see is that we cannot know. And this burns my heart, he says. He says, granted, I'm smarter than all those fops, doctors, masters, scribes, and preachers. I'm not afflicted by scruples and doubts, not afraid of hell or the devil, but in return, all joy is torn from me. I don't pretend to know a thing worth knowing. I don't pretend that I can teach, improve, or convert my fellow men, nor have I property or gold or honor and glories in this world no dog would choose to live this way therefore i've turned to magic so that by the spirit's might and main i might yet learn some secret lore that's your thesis statement for basically all of faust um and he starts doing alchemical spells here which is pretty interesting um he draws the circle around him draw the circle around me thrice uh he starts carving runes and sigils and glyphs and calling on spirits, and he eventually calls down the earth spirit, but then eventually Mephistopheles appears, and his assistant, Wagner, tells him, but what of the world, the human heart and intellect? One tries so hard to gain some knowledge, and he says, oh, yes, they like to call it knowledge. Who can give the child its rightful name? Those few who gained a share of understanding, who foolishly unlocked their hearts, their pent-up feelings, and their visions to the rabble have always ended on the cross and pyre. Forgive me, friend, the night is well advanced. We must suspend our conversation. He's blasphemy. Um, nothing is good enough for him, right? But he, his, but his problem is that he is a temporal creature. He is a he is a creature. He is temporal. Um, his hubris certainly uh, extends past the beyond, you know, beyond the bounds of reality. But, uh, but. He's yet to learn that. He's yet to learn what hubris is. Um, he's yet to learn humility. A fiery chariot born on nimble wings approaches me. I'm prepared to change my course to penetrate the ether's high dominions toward novel spheres of pure activity. Do you, scarcely better than a worm, deserve this lofty life and heavenly de delight? Now be resolute and turn your back on our Earth's endearing sun. Be bold and brash and force the gates. That's Macbeth. Be bold, bloody, resolute. Um, uh, and from which men shrink and slink away. The time has come to prove by deeds that man will not give into God's, into God's superior might and will not quake before the pit where fantasy condemns itself to tortures of its own creation when he advances to the narrow passageway about whose mouth infernal flames are blazing. Approach the brink serenely and accept the risk of melting into nothingness. This is why Nietzsche loved this play, of course. You could tell Nietzsche loved it just from the language of facing the abyss and you can tell Crowley loved it of course for a, a sort of diff a differing Nietzschean version of facing the abyss and crossing it but this is Faust in his alchemical mystery trying to penetrate the abyss of knowledge so that he can be wise but really what he, I mean really what he, it boils down to in a way is that he just wants what every other creep wants right which is he wants to know everything all at once only through sensory detail and empirical data because even with all of his knowledge and his even his penetrating into magic and, and magic rituals and alchemy, he still hasn't learned um, the metaphysical, which is crazy, which is crazy when you read this. Uh, and now come down my goblet of pure crystal. Let me pluck from your dusty pouch. I've neglected you for many years once you glittered at ancestral banquets. He says, here is a juice that quickly will intoxicate the murky sap which I prepared is now contained and within this hollow shell. And so what he does is, of course, he's drinking the witch's brew, but this is an alchemical juice that he's drinking. He's drinking that lean. He's drinking that Ninja Turtle lean. 
<laughs> Y'all, look. Look what I got. I got that nuclear juice. I got me some nuclear juice. I got me some uh, Zip Wow. You want me to try it? Right, I'm doing an unboxing right here. I'm going to drink some Zip Wow and see if this gives me some Zip. This is nuclear juice from Ninja Turtles. Woo! Damn, it tastes like poison. I see everything, man. I've seen some things, man, and some stuff. She's drinking that nuclear juice. What do you call this? Yeah, he's drinking that. He's drinking that Ninja Turtle barrel. He's drinking that barrel of dirty lean, whatever that is. <laughs> I got it at the mini mart. <laughs> it costs like it costs twenty five cents or something. It's the only drink you can get anymore for twenty five cents. All right. What's a Red Bull cost? Like a ten, 10 zillion ether coin or whatever? Uh-huh. Okay. So, man, it made my heart hurt. Oh, man. <laughs> that would be really sad to collapse from nuclear juice, from Ninja Turtle nuclear juice on, on a stream. <laughs> what, a, what a way to go. God, it's, hard, it's hurting my heart. <laughs> man, this drink is, <laughs> I better drink some more. <laughs> Uh, I had to wash down that first gulp of poison. Uh, I can feel the fluoride. Oh, God. That's so bad. <laughs> uh, it's like that bug juice at camp, right? Just throw it, just slop it right in the barrel. Right? And put some nuclear waste in it and make it green. Mm. Uh, I like how they put it in a barrel, in a jug. You like how they put it in a jug? <laughs> Drink that lean jug. Okay. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, this is line 1022 here, still book one. A few more steps up that rock and let us rest from our wanderings. I mean, even that's Miltonian, right? That's Satan resting on the on the rock beside the lake of fire in book one of Paradise Lost, talking to uh, Beelzebub. And so with our hellish potions, we raged about, that's what that was, a hellish potion. We raged about these plains and mountains, and we were more deadly than the plague. I myself administered the poison. I saw thousands wilt and now must live to see how praise is heaped upon the shameless killers. Well, that's a statement about something that just happened. Right? Because, of course, he is a, uh, he's a, this is a, a this, it's, he's doing the Faucian bargain, right? Faustian bargain. He's a high priest of say, of, of scientism. He's uh ex, he's experimenting with his potions on the you know who, w- resulting in the you know what. Before me lies the day, behind the night, the sky above me and the seas below. A lovely dream. Meanwhile, the sun has slipped away. Alas, the spirit's wings will not be joined so easily to easily to heavier wings of flesh and blood. High above the plains and oceans, the cranes press onward, homeward. Bound, charm and beauty. Okay, here comes Wagner, his assistant, his homunculoid assistant, who actually contains the kind of kernel of intelligence, but is trying to tell him. It's kind of like, it's, in a way, it's kind of like King Lear talking to the jester here. Uh, Wagner says, he's like Igor. <laughs> master, oh, master, we couldn't possibly fit it in till Friday. <laughs> Remember in Blazing Saddles. Uh, do not invoke the well known. Okay, so here's what Wagner says. Do not invoke the well known troop that floats in streams and murky spheres, a source of myriad dangers for all men, issuing from every corner of the globe. The sharp toothed ghosts come from the north. Don't invoke the spirits of the air and chill you with their arrow pointed tongues that move up dry as bone from eastern skies and suck in moisture from your lungs. Those churning up from southern desert sands heap fire upon fire on your skull, the gin. While western gusts will quench your thirst, then drown you in your fertile fields, they listen gladly and are glad to do you harm and readily obey because they like to cheat. They pretend to come to you from heaven and lisp like angels when they lie to you. But let us leave. The world is turning gray. The air grows chill and mists are seeping down. We come to prize our home at at night. Why do you stop short and look so startled? What arrests you in this fading light? He's trying to tell him. Behold, uh, 
uh, uh, what does it say? It holds the, uh, the, the, the drowsy east dapple, uh, let's see. Dr- uh, what does he say in Much Do About Nothing? Um, dapples the drowsy east with spots of gray. I can't remember the line. Um, but there's also a line in Macbeth. Uh, what was the line right there? He said, uh, readily obey because they like to cheat. That's what Banquo tells Macbeth, right? Um, oftentimes the instruments of darkness uh, win us to our har- um, bring us to our harm, win us with honest trifles, only to betray us in deepest consequence. It's telling him the same thing here. Banquo is Macbeth's equal. He's not like Wagner here, but still. Um, or his better, I guess you could argue. And then um, on page 79 of this book, still book one, he starts talking about language and words because, of course, in the beginning was the word, but he starts chanting magic spells, and he invokes uh, the Goetia. Glowing eyes and vicious teeth. Oh, I'm sure of you for such a half-satanic brood, the key of Solomon will do. So he's doing the key of Solomon, and he brings in Mephistopheles, and, of course, Mephistopheles appears, and... Mephistopheles, okay, so here's where Mephistopheles appears. He says, why all this noise? What is the gentleman's pleasure? He says, Faust says, what is your name? Ask him his name, invokes the spirit, right? Uh, Mephistopheles says, this seems a trifling question. Uh, Yo, shouts out to Edward III, who just dropped a $5 super chat. I read Damien Eccles' book on how to conjure angels. He didn't conjure any, but this dude was in rehab with, did, he got hired at a mattress store. (laughs) Well, oftentimes, this is what it says. Oftentimes the instruments of darkness, you know, appear as angels of light, but they are uh, Luciferian devils. Um, or the, in terms of the Goetia or the Key of Solomon. Um, thank you for that super chat, Edward III. Really appreciate you. He says, uh, this seems a trifling question for one so scornful of the word, for one removed from every outward show who always reaches for the inmost core. Faust says, the essence of the like of you is usually inherent in the name. It appears in all too great transparency. It's in names like Lord of the Flies, Destroyer, Liar. All right, who are you then? Mephistopheles says, a portion of that power which always works for evil and affects the good. What's the meaning of this riddle? Mephistopheles says, I am the spirit that denies forever, and rightly so. What has arisen from the void deserves to be annihilated. It would be best if nothing ever would arise, and thus what you would call havoc. Deadly sin, or briefly stated evil, that is my proper element. You call yourself a part and let you stand before me a whole? I state the modest truth to you. While every member of your race, that little world of fools, likes best of all to think himself complete, I am a portion of that part which once was everything, a part of darkness which gave birth to light, that haughty light which now disputes the rank and ancient sway of Mother Night. There's your, that's your title for uh, the Vonnegut uh, the Vonnegut uh, book that we read, we analyzed Mother Night. And though it tries its best, it won't succeed because it cleaves and sticks to bodies. The bodies mill about. Light beautifies the bodies, yet bodies have forever blocked its way, and so I hope it won't be long before all bodies are annihilated. So, of course, he appears and he says he, he's invoked and, and must tell the truth. Of course, there's a, it's a limited hangout, right? There's always a portion of a lie in here. But he's telling the truth because the bargain has to be uh, outright, he can't. He can't. He can't um, con in this sort of a wager, in this deal. He can't con Faust into something if he doesn't know the whole truth about what he's doing. He has to walk into it willingly, and of course he is. Um, but what he's saying here is that he's giving the same mo that Satan gives right at the at the uh, start of Paradise Lost, which is that. He's heard about the world that's arisen from the void, right? Uh, let there be light. God makes the earth, and then God creates human beings as his creation, and Satan and the devils hear about this from below, and then hell is empty and all the devils are here. They come up to the earth, and they try and destroy mankind and tempt them away from God's grace. And that's he tells him that's what he's here to do. Um, he says, uh, let's see, here's sigils. Faust says, against the ever-working forces, the healing and creative powers, you thrust your cold, infernal fist in truculence. It's clenched, it's clenched in vain 
so you'd better seek some other work, you fantastic son of capital C chaos. Of course, why, why is it cold? Why is it a cold infernal fist? Because just like in Dante, which far precedes this, of course, uh, the night circle is cold. It's so hot that it's cold. Um, Mephistopheles, well, let us give this matter further thought and discuss it when we meet again. May I withdraw this time with your permission? It's interesting. He has to ask his permission to leave. He's been hailed in, and then he has to ask his permission to leave. So, so this is also different from what we normally think of. Once, once Faust invokes Mephistopheles, Mephistopheles wants to leave. He's got some um, devilry to do, and of course, he's a he's a slave to time, and and he's not able to without permission so uh let's see yo shouts out to let's see somebody right there shouts out to uh jason right there who dropped 10 bucks on paypal appreciate that jason thank you so much and hey shouts out to crystalline out there thank you crystalline really appreciate you that's five bucks on cash app thank you so much very kind of you very kind of you all out there really appreciate your support um let's see what crystalline says she dropped a message Crystalline drops no message. Thank you, Crystalline, because she's driving, of course, I think, right now. So hope you're being safe out there driving. Um, Fowl says, I see no reason for your question since we have now become acquainted. You have leave to visit me at will. I said, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, dumbass. <laughs> Here's the window. The door is over there. Feel free to use the chimney, too. Mephistopheles says, I must confess there is a little obstacle that prevents my exit from this room. The wizard symbol, symbol on the sill. This is really a great detail. Faust says, the pentagram should cause you pain. Why, tell me, son of Hades, as it holds you now, how did you enter here? How did you swindle such a spirit? Mephistopheles, look closely now. The figure is not drawn too well. One of the corners facing outward, as you can see, is slightly open at the tip. A lucky accident has come my way. You, my prisoner? Well, he says he says he'll be damned. And I wrote, yes, you will be. Uh, it seems I've turned a handsome prophet. So, of course, he has drawn the circle with the pentagram to capture uh, in his magic circle Mephistopheles, but it has one, one part of the circle partly open. This invites him, but it also prevents him from leaving. Um, and now he owns him. Uh, for, and that's going to be for what is originally 24 years and then turns into Mephist um, Faust uh, getting younger in age and experiencing the the wisdom of youth of looking of being old but in in a youthful form and of course he he is the part of the deal is that he has trapped him but that he will sell himself as a as a hellish slave uh for later this is like david berkowitz territory right what do you guys think so far it said mephistopheles says a hellish law stands in the way he's he's bound by hellish laws and these are the glyphs and sigils. Wherever we steal in, we must steal out. We're free to choose the first, but the second finds us slaves. That's interesting. So that, again, is, you can see why Crowley loved this book, right? This is like uh, this damn wizard sitting here doing sorcerer, doing spells. And all of the symbols and glyphs have meaning and a law. And, of course, Goethe was a lawyer. I mentioned that earlier. But... Faust says, so hell itself has its legalities. Yes, there are rules. It's not total chaos. You're still bound by heavenly law, and you're still bound by God's law, and you're bound by the laws of hell. So hell itself has its legalities. This suits me fine, and I suppose a pact might be concluded with you, gentlemen. Mephistopheles, the promise we make you shall enjoy in full. We will not skimp or haggle, but this business should not be done so hastily. We shall have another meeting soon. But now I must ask you politely to let me out immediately. Please stay on a while and entertain me with some more details. Let me go, my friend. Mephistopheles calls him his friend now. I'll soon return. Then you can ask me at your pleasure. I did not stalk you in the field, says Faust. It's you who came and fell into the snare. Let him who snares the devil hold him fast. A second chance will not occur so soon. This reminds me of the devil and Daniel Webster. Short story right here, but that's with old Scratch. Oh, old Scratch, old Nick. And then he says, let's see, Mephistopheles, here's where the form, the form changes. See how it, it turns into a, a chimney-like form here, structure. 
He says, and this is also Macbethian, a blissful sense will come your way, then your palate will be stimulated. You will be bathed in ecstasy. For this, you need no preparation. We are assembled and now begin. So here, here are the spirits. They, occur, they appear here. And I wrote, Master and Margarita, this is Steppenwolf. This is the cavalcade of spirits. Um, it's also Marlovian. I wrote shift in form uh, equals demons and spirits descending uh, the weird sisters in Macbeth, the shorter lines. So it says, here's what the spirits say in this part. It says, uh, vanish, you gloomy high vaulting arches. Let the blue ether more gracefully shine into this cell. Let darkling clouds thin out and vanish. The firmament sparkles, mellower suns. And Faust will call upon the firmament at the end uh, in his soliloquy in Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. Mellower suns now offer their light. Spirit of beauty's heavenly suns sway and incline and hover by, follow beyond the yearning bent, and their garments, fluttering ribbons, cover the fields, cover the arbor, where steeped in their thoughts, lovers entwine, yielding for life, arbor on arbor. Tendrils budding, the weight of the grape received in the holds of ready presses, falling in torrents, the foaming winds, then seep through precious crystalline stones, leaving behind the steeper heights. They spread to the lakes to slake the thirst of greening hills and fluttering birds drink up the bliss, fly in blue space, fly to discover radiant isles that bob on the waters in friendly sway, where many sing and frolic together over the meadows, bounding and dancing, out in the open, all scatter and run. Some are scaling over the heights, others swimming over the lakes, and some soar free, all toward life, toward the sphere of loving stars or blissful favor. So this is all... This is all the language of temporal, physical ecstasy. It's a bacchanal. It's a, a cavalcade of spirits showing the brilliance and beauty of life and spring. But we know that it's all an illusion, right? It's all, this is all an illusion because the devil can't create, only mimic. So he's showing God's creation as if it's all there in a temporal instant that Faust can can bring down in a magical, magisterial ceremony all at once, but it's nothing. Uh, Bill Hicks says, lesser suns, stars, every man's a star. Yeah, certainly certainly Crowleyan and the, and the language of the Goetia and various, uh, you know, uh, Crowleyan 777 rituals um, all find their sort of essence in this. Play, in this. Um, yeah, Jesse, I'm getting the eyes wide shut in just a little bit. Um. <laughs> on page 115, I wrote, Mediocrity! Mephistopheles, I'm going to skip forward here to, to his... Uh, oh, Mephistopheles says, I pledge myself to, to the... to ser- Okay, start over. I pledge myself to serve you here and now. The slightest hint will pull me at your beck and call, as if beyond we meet again, you shall do the same for me. Faust says, with that beyond, I scarcely bother. Once we smash this world to bits, the other... World may may rise for all I care. Well, guess what? Guess what, jerk? You're a silly Billy because there is another world. And even in Revelation, in Revelation, there's a, a new heaven and a new earth, and there's another world to come. And you say you don't even care because you're going to smash this world to bits. Well, guess what, jerk? You know, this guy's a real jerk. This Faust, this Faust guy, you know, this 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 guy's a real jerk. Um, Mephistopheles, page 111, who dwells in everlasting radiant glow and relegated us to darkness. He's talking about God now. Because the, because the demons in this, even they have to respect God when they're, especially when they're talking about or in his presence. And he's trying to tell him, back off, back off, buster. You don't need to make this deal. It's a stupid deal. But he wants him to make it anyway. So Mephistopheles, splendid words for sure. However, one thing worries me. Art is long and time is fleeting. Right? Um, Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying, right? And at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. It occurs to me that you might not yet be taught that you might yet be taught make your alliance with a poet and let that gentleman think lofty thoughts and let him heap the noblest qualities upon your worthy head, a lion's nerve, a stag's rapidity, the fiery blood of Italy, the constancy of northern man. Then let him in the sec- secret mortar to combine nobility of soul with guile and show you how to love with youthful fervor according to a balanced plan. I'd like myself to meet with such a person. 
whom I could greet as Mr. Microcosm. That's Mr. Uh, Mephistopheles says. I mean, that's even in the German. Yeah, Heron Microcosmos. Um, so what he's saying here is uh, part of the deal off, also is that you can't think lofty thoughts. You can't. You can't, um, he's not allowed to praise God or think about God or think about lofty thoughts. He has to keep, keep everything base and hellish, even though in the grandiosity of his uh, poetical thoughts and of his alchemical and learned thoughts and in his sensory, de- in his empirical data sensing sensory detail, he is uh, expounding, you know, he's going past the bounds of reality and past his corporeal form. He still is not supposed, that's part of the deal. He's not supposed to do that. Of course, he breaks the wager technically at the end when he um, seeks God's forgiveness, but then he is, he's given grace, which is, again, different in this than we normally think of Faust. We normally think of the Faustian bargain as you make the deal, you sold your soul, and you go to hell. But that's not the way it is with this uh, particular work, with Goethe's Faust, which is interesting. It's, It's just so funny that Things are so different from the way that we expect them to be in these things. Mediocrity. I'll drag him through this. Oh, and by the way, the constancy of northern man is a Shakespeare and Caesar reference. Um, But I am constant as the northern star of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. So in the world. That's what Caesar says. When they ask him to change his mind right before they uh, smoke him in the Senate. Um... This word, okay, a line 1859, leapfrogs headlong over earthly pleasure. Again, you know, this, this is why with Shakespeare or with even with this, where he says he never saw um, or read Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, I have my doubts about that. I mean, maybe he uh, got this through at osmosis, but there are certain words in the sort of coded language of poetry of the poetic form where th- th- they exist as part of the the speaker or the poet's r- uh, rattle bag, right? As Ted Hughes says, like when when you use the word headlong, it's a it's an interesting and unique and very specific word to use in light of Faust and Do- and Marlowe says that I'll headlong run into the earth, and here he uses headlong. I know it's just there's only so many words, and but of course it's German, but still. Um, Der Erde Freuden überspringt. I'll drag him through the savage life, through the wasteland of mediocrity, is what Mephistopheles says. And he's talking about Faust here in his soliloquy. Let him wriggle, stiffen, wade through slime. Let food and drink be dangled by his lips to bait his hot, insatiate appetite. He will vainly cry for satisfaction. Had he not by then become the devil's, he would perish miserably. So... It's interesting that, you know, part of the part of the journey here is that he Mephistopheles intends that in the end, and this is partly right for scholars. In the end, it's not the vault; it's not vaulting ambition that uh, in into which you find yourself. It's actually just uh, the base slime of mediocrity, which is which is worse than obscurity. Right, that's Salieri. That's uh, you know, because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Here's Mephistopheles on page 149 with the language of Macbeth: "False when and false where the foul and fair be here, be there." Right, fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. That's how Macbeth starts. And of course, when Macbeth appears in the play, his first, the first thing he says is, "So foul and fair a day I have not seen." which is a mixture of the two, but it's also an inversion. It's an, it's an unconscious inversion of foul and fair, right? So the beautiful day is nothing to him. It's the foul dare, day that's beautiful to him because he's just this, uh, he's just um, gotten out of the battle, right, where he uh, unseamed him from the nave to the chops. But also because, because ugliness and terror are beautiful to the weird sisters, to the witches, to the three fates, and the three fates sort of occur in part two with the the uh, the great white way, the the watchers, the women who appear. Um, let me skip to uh, later on, forest and cavern. Here we go with um, the start of the Valpurgis knock scene. When the wind 
when the winds roar in and rattle and giant spruces break and topple, crushing neighbors and obstructing limbs, and the hill responds with inward thunder, then you lead me to the sheltered cavern and show me to myself, and then reveal to me profundities within my breast. And when the pure moon rises soothingly before my gaze, the silver phantoms of a bygone age drift toward me from rocky walls and dew-soaked bushes and temper, meditations, austere pleasure. This is a platonic sense uh, uh, of searching inward, and this is um, Faust talking here in a Byronic sense uh, at the start of the Valpurgis Knock scene where there's a cavalcade of spirits and witches. Um, and um, and later he he hears Margaret talking, but I hate him from the bottom of my soul. Nothing is in all my days wounded me as deeply in my heart as that repulsive person's hard face. She's talking about Mephistopheles here. So the person that Faust uh, seduces here, who is the supposed to be the embodiment of of uh, innocence, because he's a creep. Um, even or, even Margaret or Gretchen, they are they find the sight of Mephistopheles repugnant because they are sensitive to this evil spirit. Everybody else, even when Mephistopheles is in is in disguise or shape shifts. He's following, like, there's, there's one part where he's following them in a, like, as a black dog, and Faust recognizes, Faust can recognize the spirits, and the spirit of the, and the innocent people can recognize the spirits of ugliness and evil, but everybody in between sort of just goes about their life and doesn't have any sensitivity to it. They're either, they're too far. They're too far away. Faust is too close to hell, and she is too close to innocence. But, Again, uh, seeking the the uh, seeking oneself inside one's you know the deepest uh, depths of oneself in the abyss is a sort of a Nietzsche and Crowleyan element here, but also is going to play a role with uh, Trom novel and with Oswald Shut because Bill Hartford or what's the protagonist's name in this uh, what's his what's his name? Friedelin, Friedelin, yeah, Friedelin, who is Bill Hartford, um, is his, the whole point is that he is, one of the points is that he is searching for something outside of himself, right, because he's searching outside of the hearth at home. He says at one point in the book he'll do anything to get away from his wife, um, and he ends up in the inner sanctum sanctorum of these devil people, but even they are confined within their their cloaks and their masks so they're still hidden they're they're even hidden from themselves but they can't hide from uh god's justice and they can't hide from this faustian bargain that they've taken on and friedelin sort of learns that bill hartford learns that as he goes on that's why at the end of the movie when he gets home you know he sees the mask on the pillow i'm gonna get to this in a second but uh yeah it says unsolved mysteries um, he sees the mask on the pillow, and uh, he is unable to get away from what he himself has become, which is he's wearing a mask of his own face, essentially. So, um, let's see. I'm going to skip forward now to, yeah, here's uh, Master and Margarito on page 275 of this, this book. Squire Voland has arrived. Voland is the another name for the satanic spirit in the cavalcade. They experience the same thing in Master and Margarita. You can go by, back and watch my stream on that. And it becomes uh, the Valpurgis Knock dream. Valpurgis Night's dream, which is a Midsummer Night's dream. Oberon and Titania's, uh, Titania's, um, Titania's Golden Wedding, which is a scene in the play where we have a cavalcade of different characters and spirits that are all congregating on the mountain in Valpurgisnacht. And at this point, at this point, at the end of book one, Faust starts to realize uh, what he's done and where he is and that he's sort of lost and all this stuff. Um, and that he truly is seeing something that he wouldn't have known before. And then, of course, in book two, um, it takes us back to classical Greece and the form changes in the book. Eventually, he asks for grace and he is forgiven. Uh, there's a deus ex machina. God literally reaches down or speaks down from heaven and says, no, you can't take him. 
Um, Arthur Schnitzler's Dream Story, which was first published in 1926, is interesting because um, it takes place in Vienna, and we have the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There's a sense of alienation within the speaker in this, but uh, the alienation is going to further because he thinks that he is somebody. He thinks that he's a an important guy. He's important in society. He's a doctor to the elites, and then he finds uh, that he's simply blackmailed into the, into into their society and into the situation. That's the that's one of the whole points of um, uh, Eyes Wide Shut. This says. Um, let's see. Let me get to one of the first parts in this. Um, the book starts off. Uh, 24 brown slaves rode the splendid galley that would bring Prince Amgiad to the caliph's palace, but the prince, wrapped in his purple cloak, lay alone on the deck beneath the deep blue, star-spangled night sky in his gaze. Up to that point, the little girl had been reading aloud. Now, quite suddenly, her eyes closed. Her parents looked at each other with a smile, and Friedelin bent over, kissed her flaxen hair, and snapped shut the book that was resting on the table, which had not yet been cleared. The child looked up as if caught out. Nine o'clock, time for bed. It's interesting, because... The story begins on the brink of a dream, just like Eyes Wide Shut begins at nighttime with Jaken and Boaz on either side and Nicole Kidman uh, stripping in the movie. But it's it's on the brink of the child going to bed and they're going to go to the Christmas party, right? And then there's going to be the after party um, and then the after after party. But it's this starts with this sort of dreamlike language, and it also is reminiscent of Faust, right? It it almost begins in the Valpurgis Knock scene where we had just left off, um, and so what happens is uh, they go they go to a party, and when they come back, um, Friedelin in the book, it the movie roughly follows the book, uh, but. Friedelin is sent to take care of this woman and her dad. A count has just passed away, and you can tell that she's in love with him. Um, but he sort of rebuffs her, and then he walks around. He's walking around town. He gets uh, pushed aside by a group of rowdy young lo- uh, young um, youths, and then he meets this guy Noctigal, who is of course Nick Nightingale, and. In the bo- in the film, uh, Nick Nightingale is playing piano at the Christmas party, um, but in the book, he meets him in uh, one of the cafes, and then he says, you know, he was supposed to be a doctor, but he's not now. He's just playing piano. And then uh, Noctigal or Nightingale says, oh, you're mistaken. It's not what you think. I've seen quite a lot of things, things you wouldn't believe in such small towns, especially in Romania, but one lives and learns. Here, however, he drew the yellow curtain back a little looked out onto the street, and as if to himself, he said, not sure yet. I mean, the coach, I've always picked up by a coach. It's a different one each night. And then, of course, listen, said Nightingale after some hesitation. If there's anyone in the world I'd do a favor for, it's you, but how would we go about it? Do you have the courage? Do you have the courage? So this is interesting because in Eyes Wide Shut and in uh, Trom Novel, it's it's as if Bill is being gang stalked and gaslit i mean it's he's walking around the gaslit uh, town right here at night um but he's being gaslit into going to this situation in the first place everything sort of leads him there it's it seems no accident that nightingale is there to meet him and is playing at the party and then gets him to go this is after tom cruise in the in the movie of course right is at the party and he's asked upstairs when he's walking around, by the way when he's walking around the party it is so weird when you go back and I watch Eyes Wide Shut that they go to the Christmas party. They're walking in. Uh, Nicole Kidman, Dr. Anthony Kidman's daughter, um, is walking around this Christmas party. And, like, there are Christmas lights on the wall, and there's, like, cascading lights and everything. But it, they don't look like Christmas decorations I've ever seen. Now, yes, on the surface, there's, Chris, there's like, Christmas trees everywhere in the movie. It's a Christmas movie. But notice the soft light and notice how the sort of eerie soft light in – it's almost like we're looking at ornaments on a tree like all the characters are just ornaments. Like, they're all there just to decorate this pagan thing, right? I'm not saying the Christmas tree's pagan. I'm saying in the, in, the, in, the, in the movie and in the book, 
we see that sort of level of symbolism of it. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that they all sort of seem like baubles and elements that somebody else has stuck up on a tree just for their own amusement, right? Because that's one of the things about amusement is that is that one of the points that's I think often missed, not by the not by the base people, but one of the points that's often missed of Faust and Eyes Wide Shut and uh, the Dream Story is the purpose of Albertine or uh, whatever her name is in um, Eyes Wide Shut is Nicole Kidman's character, or she's Albertine in the in the book, but that. When he gets back from the ritual and he's talking to his wife, this occurs in both works, she immediately wakes up from a dream, so it becomes meta because it's there's a dream and it's the dream story and it seems dreamlike. And she immediately tells the story about how she was at a place where she was uh, disrobed and in the movie, it's like a na- it's like a navy guy. It's very weird in the movie. It looks like Skinamax or something. Like this navy guy comes out and he seduces her and she starts making love to him. But in the movie, in the book, she talks about how there are like hundreds of men, and she gives herself to him, and then one uh, stands forward and redeems redeems her, and it's him. And she watches him try to redeem her, and then she laughs in his face. And watches as he's taken away. And so the part of the psychopathy of this whole thing is the idea of the look on the face. It, it, psychos often do this. You notice you get this with a lot of testimony of, of stories about psychopaths or court cases where, um, like, like with, especially with Ted Bundy, where it's the look on the face. It's the, it's the absolute, um, shock and and horror of the event and the the realization that the thing has occurred and the psycho laughs in the face of the victim right and that's exactly what she does to him and that leads us to obviously think that she was at the ceremony she's she's in the cult and the reason i say that is because um in the movie you know we have nuala windsor we have the windsor we have a windsor girl and we've got and we, we, he's constantly chasing around these ladies of the night. And in the book, uh, Friedland thinks that they're all um, thoughts, like around town. But what he comes to realize is that the name of the hooker that he, or the sex worker that he's given um, at the beginning, right? Because she, in the movie, she, she has a speedball OD. And in the book, she has a morphine OD. And so... He thinks that she's a lady of the night. That's what he's told by Ziegler in the movie. But it turns out that later it's said that she was a daughter of a bear. She was a baroness. Now, the question is, is she a baroness or not? Are they just saying that? They're, they can't find anybody that matches that name. But that also speaks to the fact that he goes to the ceremony and that he can't recognize anybody. He doesn't know who anybody is. He can't. He, th- th- there's all these powerful people there, and he can't recognize them. But they're obviously all barons and baronesses. And that leads us to believe that Nicole Kidman, who is already somebody married to Tom Cruise. I mean, that's a, there's also a triple meta version of this because Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman are chosen for this movie. Um, and Stanley Kubrick obviously uses them as pawn pieces, right, in the film. Like, so, so he cast Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman has Dr. Anthony Kidman and all that stuff, and Tom Cruise and all his stuff, and they're also two two people who think that they're at the top of society, but then they come to realize there's something above them. So it's like there is a there's a there's a a, a weird series of layers of meta in this. Does that make sense? And and that um, Bill or Friedelin thinks that he is chasing people who are below him, but they're actually above him, and that's how he's blackmailed into it. When he meets uh, Nick Nightingale, um, Nick Nightingale says, I can see things in the mirror through the black silk silk scarf tied over my eyes. Um, Don't call them females. You've never seen such women. Was it worth it? Yeah, it's worth it if you're strong enough, he's saying to him, but in the inverted sense. 
Uh, Friedelin grips him. I won't let you get out of this. You're, you're going to take me with you. I know it's dangerous. Perhaps that's exactly what attracts me. So it's that he, he, this is the Faustian bargain. He willingly walks into this thing. He knows, or at least he thinks he knows, what the outcome could be, but he has no idea just how bad it gets. Um, I'll shoulder all responsibility for the risk you're taking, Nightingale, upon my word of honor. And then, guess what? Uh, one thing that they don't do in the movie is they Nightingale gets into a what looks like a hearse, and when Friedelin is taken back from the party, because in the movie, in the movie, it's a he gets into a taxi, and that's one of the giveaways, right? Like he arrives to the uh, our child mansion in a taxi, and he he splits his hundred dollar bill in half and says, you know, wait here, and I'll give you the other half of this fifty bucks. But in the book. He goes in a coach, a coach and horses, and he's locked into it. There's no way out. It's a Ted Bundy car. He can't get out. There's no windows. He can't see where he's going, and it's like he's going into death. He's going to die. His ego is going to die. His pride is going to die. He's going to be humiliated. He's going to be humiliated by his wife, and he's going to emerge as a new person who's been blackmailed by the Jeff Stein McEffrey group. Uh, first, he has to stop by uh, where the rainbow ends, right? Uh, over the rainbow, which of course, you know, Jay points this out brilliantly in in uh, in his streams on this and in an Esoteric Hollywood, talking about where the rain over the rainbow. So we get Wizard of Oz elements of this. We get uh, the path to illumination. There's you know there's a sense of the Dorothy character. There's also of course there's the Wizard of Oz, the man you know behind the curtain, and everybody at the party is literally behind a curtain because they're all in in like monks' habits. They're all in costume. They're all in mask. It's a, you know, Venetian ball, but they're all in mask and they're all still behind the curtain. So once you see who behind who is behind the curtain, then you've entered the Emerald City. Emerald is off always used. We've we've covered that so many times on this channel in so many works about the color green, the green vapor in Dracula, the green in Frankenstein, the green every evil work that we or work that we come across about evil always has green associated with, with um, decay, uh, with this sort of, sort of overarching metaphysical decay of of uh, satanic inversion. I mean, even in even in um, Great Gatsby. Remember when we we did Great Gatsby and you see the green light on the other end of the harbor, right? Um, and we sort of figured out in that one that G Great Gatsby is is. Jeff Stein McEffrey Island. It's he's running an operation. The same thing. Um, but when he comes to uh, the rainbow, and in the movie it's Raid Serbija, right? However you say his name, I love that guy. He plays. Uh, he's in um, the Saint. He plays um, a kind of Dugan character in the Saint, right? He's uh, what's his name? Bullet Tooth. T Is he Bullet Tooth Tony? In um, in the other movie, Snatch. Anyway, that guy's cool. He's in a lot of movies. But in this, he is uh, playing a guy who is obviously a creeper, and um, Lily Sobieski is being crept on by these two um, Eastern— it's a kind of— but she's being crept on by Yakin and Boaz, uh, Oriental style, uh, under the rainbow. And, of course, they came to a, an arrangement, he says later on. And, and Bill is even— Bill is even cornered into creeperdom in this. I say cornered because he corners himself, but he experiences creeper thoughts in this where at first he wants to save her and then it becomes something, to, he becomes like intoxicated by her perfume is gross. Um, but when he gets to the uh, the place where he has to wear, he has to get the costume, um, it's slightly different. I mean, in the movie, Kubrick, one one difference between the movie and the book is that the movie really does a great job of showing us um, and the book has to tell us a lot because it doesn't have to be that way, but the images are like, we're, there's a lot of exposition in the book. Um, but the movie is simply, we're presented with the images and he shows us. Um, and, um, in the movie, when they go to the mass ball, of course, it's like, uh, it's the, our child Getty, uh, masked balls, like with the lady with the deer antlers and the fucking be uh, bird cage on her head right and there's a guy with a picasso mask there's a there's a plague doctor there there's a 
there's all these the Bob Hope, the Bob Hope face is there, Candy Jones, uh, in the film, which is all to say that they're wearing masks of their own faces or of their own souls. But they never, it's interesting because there's so much never revealed in the movie, even about the characters. And Ziegler later, Ziegler later is going to say, you know, I was there, knock, knock, he says. Notice, Rob Ager pointed this out, that (laughs) when the guy in red And if you tell anyone what you have seen tonight, there will be the most dire consequences for you and your family. That guy? So he is sitting on a red, uh, on a a Masonic throne with a, a red carpet with all these masked people around him, circles within circles. Notice how they close ranks around Bill Hartford. And he's got his two ravens on his side like he's a kind of odin figure or a or a you know a satanic figure with beelzebub and mephistopheles on his on his uh sides like he's an anti you know like he's a well i would say an anti-pope like he's a pope (laughs) um and doing the uh crowley and sex magic ceremony with the bowing and the masonic kissing and all that stuff but at the end of the film ziegler invites him into the biggest um, like his drawing room it is in his New York townhouse condo, right? Ziegler is like the head of, you know, rack block or something like that, right? And he's he's got like, notice on his table, it's like, he's like, you want a drink? And he's got like the, a, a million bottles on this table. He's got everything. He's got, he's got um, Boris Balkin's first edition library all around him. I mean, it's like, it's huge, but he's got a red pool. He's got a pool table with red felt on it, right? And he... He even does the same knocking that the red guy does, like knock, knock. All right, let's 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 cut the bullshit here, right? Remember he says that, and he says you went in there, and he points the same finger. I think what happens there is that I've always assumed. I mean, Ziegler it, to me is obviously the guy with the. There's a woman next to him, and they're on the top levels of when he walks into the ritual, and they they're the ones who turn. And look at him and then turn away. And, you know, Bill kind of nods to them. I've always thought that's Ziegler and his wife, which would be like a Jeff Stein, McEffrey, and, and Gieselin up there, up on the upper decks. Right. Um, and that and that I've always thought kind of that it would, maybe it would be like Zandor. It's like Anton Zandor LeVay or whatever. The, the Count. Um, Sky Dumont is the actor. Sky Dumont is the actor that um, Nicole Kidman meets at the party. And tries to seduce her with, uh, you know, references to Ovid, metamorphosis, and love, and lust, and all this stuff. I kind of thought maybe he was the guy in red. I mean, I know who the actor is who played the guy in red uh, in the movie. That was Kubrick's assistant. But I'm saying in terms of the characterization. But what happens is that the characters start to mimic the body language of each other throughout those scenes, right? So that's the reason Ziegler does the finger pointing. He does the knock-knocking. It's sort of a, um, a tell for the thing in which they're involved, right? What else was I going to say? Um, Sky Dumont is an interesting actor because if you go to his biography, it says that he uh, escaped with his family um, during uh, Dub, Dub Dub Deuce uh, to get away from the, uh, the Zanies, <laughs> but it's obviously just he wrote the Wikipedia, right? Because... Because his family is a, a German industrialist family that, um, and his fa- I think his father was in that um, double-lettered organization in the Zanies. So they didn't go there to escape. They just went there with the other people to like Argentina to, uh, to do the Colonia Dignidad or whatever. But anyway, so it, but it also, it's like, again, reality and reality mimicking art and vice versa, all in this sort of weird synthesis. Um, yeah, red is an important color for them for sure. I mean, it's hellish, first of all. It's obviously hellish. You're walking into a hellish ceremony. You're gonna this is where you're gonna be burned. And you're also gonna be laid bare. He asked it's interesting that Bill walks into the ceremony and he's asked the password. There's no password. The password in the book is Denmark. Um, and it becomes Fidelio, the Beethoven um opera in the book, or sorry, in the movie. But Remember, he's asked to remove his clothes. He's going to be laid bare and sacrificed in front of this group. But he is redeemed, and he's redeemed by 
uh, I assume, um, not Domino, but the girl from the beginning of the movie, right? And Domino later occurs. But all, all the people that he, what's interesting is that in the movie, all of the people that he comes across, every single one of them, every single person Bill comes across, even the guys on the street who call him a F slur when he's walking, uh, and that occurs in the book, all of these people seem like they are plants and like they are all part of this group. Like he goes to the newsstand and he picks up the newspaper and it says lucky to be alive, right? And then he's got the guy gang stalking him, doing a revolving tail walking down the street. That guy was at the ceremony. Um, uh, I mean, I wouldn't put it past the doorman at the hotel, the, the rat, the beady-eyed rat creature at the hotel. That guy was in the ceremony. Um, Do- Domino, the girl in, with the red hair, the girl at the beginning, his wife. Xandor LeVay, uh, Ziegler was there. The, the, the daughter of the Countess looks like she's in the group. All these people are in the group, but he doesn't know that he's in the group. And he's getting into this group, and then he finds, oh, there's people above me, and he's blackmailed into the group, so now he's part of it. Right? He's an agent of these people. He's not at the same level they are, but he's an agent of them. And in the book, of course, he says, I want a dark monk's habit in black mask which is to sh- say he wears a, he wants a black mask because he's going to a black mass and he wants a dark monk's habit because he's going in t- as an, advert- an in- inverted, subverted, satanic monk into this ceremony. The password is Denmark. That later occurs um, in the book because the, lo- the woman that he, that he loved first, I think, was in Denmark, so a Danish girl. Um... Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, it, it says uh, the password's Denmark. This is page 42. As though participating in some prank, directed his driver to follow the hearse just setting off in front of him. He's following death, right, going to this place. Um, also, remember that I did the Kubrickon analysis. I did like a three-hour analysis of Kubrick, uh, Jason Horsley's book. So you can go back and watch that too uh, where we dealt with this. Um, he says... Uh, Friedland considered the possibility that his driver might lose sight of the coach ahead, but whenever he stuck his head out the window into the unnaturally warm air, he could still see the other coach a little distance in front and the coachman in his tall black top hat sitting motionless in the box. This also reminds me of Jack the Ripper. I mean, we did, uh, you know, sort of Victorian. We did the Jack the Ripper. This is, uh, this is um, fin de siècle, turn of the century, a little, little past uh, 1888 Denmark. Um, I mean, 1888 uh, Victorian London with Jack the Ripper, but we did that stream on that too. It could all end disaster- disastrously, thought Friedelin, yet he was still conscious of the scent of roses and powder. He's constantly intoxicated by the scent of uh, the youthful, uh, budding uh, spring, rites of spring sense of roses and, um, and powder and perfume. What does Rambo, says, what does Rambo say? Uh, the purple perfumes of the polar night. What strange adventure did I brush past there, he asked himself. I shouldn't have left. Perhaps it was my duty not to. Right. It was your duty not to leave, fucking creep. Leaving at the under the rainbow place where that thing was happening? Yes. It was your duty not to leave there. Yeah, but you wanted wanted this so badly. That was your first stop on the – that was not your first stop, but that was the last stop before the big uh, blackmail ceremony. That was your chance to do something good. Far down to the left, floating in the haze, he could see the city gleaming with a thousand lights. Like he's looking down the city of Dis here. Then hearing the sounds of wheels behind him, he looked back out of the window. Two coaches were following them, and this pleased him, since now the driver of the hearse could not possibly be suspicious of him. He took time and disguised himself. The coach came to a halt. Suppose, thought Friedland, I didn't get out at all and drove back at once instead. But where to? Yeah, go back home to the little uh, Pierrette or the little trollop in the Buchfeld de Gasse, or to Marianne, the daughter of the dead ca- court counselor, or home. And with a slight shudder, he realized there was nowhere he wanted to go less. Or was it because that path seemed more circuitous to him? No, I can't go back, he thought to himself. My way lies forward, even were it to my death. He couldn't help laughing at these melodramatic notions, but even so, he did not feel altogether at his ease. Of course, he laughs. He laughs. He has a devilish laughter knowing that the way forward is the way into perdition. 
just like his wife, just like his wife laughs at him, just like just like Faust has this sense of hellish glee going into this shit, right? There was a garden gate standing wide open. So he's walking into, he's walking into a kind of inverted neo-Gnostic satanic garden here. The hearse in front of him drove on further down into the ravine, or as it seemed to him, into the dark abyss. Evidently, Noctigal had already alighted. Friedelin hastily climbed out of his carriage and instructed the coachman to wait at the corner of his return, however long that might be. And to secure his further services, he paid him handsomely in advance, promis- promising him an equal ride, uh, fee for the ride home, just like in the film. Friedelin glimpsed a veiled female figure getting out. Lowering his mask, he went into the garden where a narrow path illuminated from the house led to the front door. Its two wings sprang open and Freeland found himself in a narrow white hallway. The sound of a harmonium reached his ears and on either side, two servants in dark livery were standing, their faces hidden behind gray masks. The pass, the password? Fidelio. No, he says, he says, Denmark. Of course it's Fidelio because he is now pledging his fidelity to the group without knowing it. Which part of which, uh, which part of which? Um, part of which is the blindfolding ceremony, the mask ceremony, let the brother receive the light, right? And the humiliation ritual. All of that. It reads and it the movie shows like a Masonic allegory or an allegory into the mysteries of the occult. Here he says, Denmark, one of the servants took charge of his fur coat and disappeared with it into an adjacent room, the other opened a door and Freeland entered a dark, dimly lit, high-ceilinged room draped with black silk hangings. Fucking hell, dude. Look, man. All right, look. Let me catch my breath here and drink some nuke juice. Ah! Ah! <laughs> I'm fluoridated! <laughs> Gross. Okay, look. All right, that's my last experiment with the nuclear juice. Um, if you're going to a party and uh, it's a masked ball and you get there and um, you don't know where you're going and there's a hearse driving you there and um, there's over the rainbow illumination, uh, two Masonic wings opening up, a dude in a throne and a bunch of black drapes, you're, you're, you're at the ditty party or whatever. You got to get the fuck out. Excuse my language. Do not go there. Go back and, uh, you, you first of all, go back to that shop and fucking, okay, I can't say what I want to say, but you need to, um, you need to, uh, uh, be virtuous. Let's just say that. How about that? Vigorous virtue. That sounds good. That's what you need to do. You, you know what you need to do. Look, are you strong enough? Right? Was it worth it? Okay. So he says, um, uh, let's see. His second gaze bored deep into Friedland's eyes from behind his mask. A strange, sultry fragrance enveloped him as if from southern gardens. Again, someone touched him on the arm. This time it was a nun, a, a dark nun. Like the other, she had covered her brow, head, and neck with a black veil, and her blood-red mouth glistened beneath her black lace mask. Oh, fucking hell, man. Where am I, thought Friedland, among madmen, among conspirators? He says that in the book. Have I strayed into a gathering of some religious sect? Answer, yes. Had Noctegal perhaps been ordered or paid to bring someone uninitiated for them to have a bit of fun with? It says that in the book. Yet for a prank at a masked ball, it seemed far too earnest, too monotonous, and too eerie. Don't turn around, this girl says to him. There's still time for you to leave. You don't belong here. If they were to discover you, you'd be in serious trouble. Friedland started. For an instant, he considered heeding the warning, but curiosity, temptation, and above all, pride were stronger than all the other considerations. That's it. That's the... Do you see why now I use the Faustian bargain for the analysis for this book as well and for Eyes Wide Shut? It's this, it's the same thing. Now, look, we're all, you know, we all have, unfortunately, pride and temptation. We live in a fallen world, right? Also, people use the word prideful now. 
When did they start using that? It used to be pride. Right? Pride cometh before the fall. They, remember, it was just pride. The word was pride. What, when they started, you're, they were proud, which can mean two things, the good and the bad. But I guess they changed it to the word prideful. Has that always been a word? When did they start using prideful? I went to the concert. I was happy full. But yeah, it's, so he, he makes a choice and he keeps going. Okay. It's also the same in Poe's Mask of the Red Death. Uh, this is also in the Decameron. It's a series of, you know, ritualistic masks, masked balls, where it's always people wearing masks of essentially their own soul. They are hidden in plain sight until you get to their uh, dark draped ritual. And they're still hidden. Right? Because that symbolizes their uh, tentacles, their, their specter tentacles through society. He says, um, Meanwhile, the voice of the singer had, mo- singer had modulated from gloomy solemnity via an artfully ascending trill into a mood of levity and jubilation. In place of the harmonium, a, pi- a piano had struck up a more impudent and earthy note. So here we get the, the earthy note. The juxtaposition between the harmonium and the, and the harmony and the earthy note is supposed to be the trill sound of uh, discontinuity and chaos mixed with the kind of... Uh, br- uh, Brock, what do you call it? The Brocken Valpurgis knock ceremony. Wild and rousing touch with the female voice hitherto so noble culminated in a shrill, lascivious screech which seemed to take off through the roof into infinity. Doors on either side opened and through one set, Friedland recognized the shadowy outline of uh, Nightingale's figure at the piano while the room opposite was suffused with dazzling light. Yeah, dark, so dark the darkness was visible. Right, you're in the Luciferian light. Black lace mask over her face, but otherwise completely naked. Fridolin's eyes roved hungrily from sensuous to slender figures and from, oh, gross, I'm not going to say that. And the fact that each of these beauties still remain a mystery and that from behind the mask, large eyes as unfathomable as riddles sparkled at him, transformed his indescribably strong urge to watch into an almost intolerable torment of desire. Sensory, sensory, Temptation. The other men were evidently... It's all decay, though. Do you get it? It's all decay. All the sensory temptation is all just death and decay. That's why in Dr. Faustus, um, in the Richard Burton production of Dr. Faustus, which I watched, there's a great scene where he's being tempted by angels and devils. Or The angels are trying to tell him, don't be tempted. And there's devils talking to him saying, no, 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 forget about it. It's all right. But he looks up and he sees a statue, a beautiful statue turned to decay. It's the same in uh, Hereditary, right, where they have the decayed, it's supposed to be a decayed st- uh, statue which turns to a, dead bo- a headless dead body and then is supplanted by the boy who's now the living embodiment of, 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 Paym- of Paymon, the demon of death and decay, with a crown of death. Right, because the devils are leading you towards death and decay and temptation and destruction, away from eternal life. The first moments of breathtaking delight gave way to sighs of deep distress. A cry escaped from someone, and then suddenly, as if they were being chased, they all charged, now no longer in their monkish cowls, but dressed in festive white, yellow, blue, or crimson courtier's clothes, out of the dimly lit room towards the women where they were received with insane, almost sinister laughter. It turns into an open bacchanal. Right. Remember, the, the Bacchanal, the Bacchae, Euripides Bacchae, turns into a frenzy. So the, the purpose is that for six months of the year, the women rove the countryside, right, drinking and merrymaking, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, uh, wine, women, and song. And then for the other half, the hangover, uh, that results in decay and sputum and b- vomit and death. Right, where the women rove the countryside, tearing the men to pieces. Don't ask questions, said the one who remained behind Friedland, and don't be astonished at anything. I've done my best to mislead her, but I can tell you now it won't succeed for long. Fly while there's still time. That's, again, another Macbeth reference. Fly, Flance! No more than my life can be at stake, and to me this moment you're worth it, he says. What a, fu- what a dumbass. He, doesn't, he, he just doesn't know. 
He knows, but he doesn't. He refuses to see it. The aura of lascivious secrets. There was a sea change he felt within himself. She seized his hands. One night, someone did take it into his head during the dance to strip the veil from one of us. They tore off his mask and drove him out with a whip. You may have read about a beautiful young girl. It was only a few weeks ago who took poison the day before her marriage, which he later is confronted as a uh, by the, this, doc, this Dr. Adler, who's Ziegler in the movie, as a morphine OD. But they, uh, they unalived her. He's spellbound. Um, oh, then on page... Um, 50 here, it says, hadn't it been a girl from an aristocratic family engaged to an Italian prince? There you go. There's your answer. It's not the, it's not the ladies of the night that you think it is, right? It's not the lowborn people. It's actually aristos. They're just made to be this, to blackmail them, and because high becomes low, but low becomes high, right? But not in a, not in a Christian sense. This is a, they are debasing and, and um, debasing themselves into decay and death here as part of this blackmail operation, but also as part of this ceremony. Um, he says he might be among fools and perhaps even among profligates, but certainly not among criminals and thugs. Well, guess what? You are. These are. This is exactly what they are. Right? <laughs> That's exactly what they are. But unlike the thief on the cross, these people think they're, uh, they think they'll never die, right? The pa- oh, yeah. Now he gets greeted by the high priest. Uh, the password to the house, if you wouldn't mind. Would you be so good as to give us the password to the house? It sounded sharp as a knife. Friedland shrugged his shoulders. The other man stepped into the middle of the room and raised his hand. Whereupon the piano fell silent. Ding, ding, ding. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> Sorry. Two other courtiers, one in yellow, the other in blue, came up. The password, sir. I've forgotten it. That's unfortunate. For it makes no difference here whether you've forgotten the password or whether you never knew it. Take off your mask. Mm. And it says, uh, Friedland held up his arm in front of him as to shield his face. It seemed to him a thousand times worse to stand there as the only one unmasked amid a host of masks than suddenly to stand naked among those fully dressed. It's not a question here of satisfaction, but of expiation. And then Domino comes out and says, I'm, or whoever the lady is, it says, I'm willing to redeem him. Here, once a pledge has been given, there's no going back. And she's taken away, and then he escapes in the hearse. He's driven away in the hearse back home. By the way, it's odd that he is given a second chance later on when he goes to the house, um, and he is passed the letter by the creepy guys behind the gate at the Archild Mansion, and they say, this is your second warning. In the book, it says this is your second warning, and he thinks to himself, it's weird that they say second warning and not final warning, which is to indicate that there will be other warnings, which is to indicate that it's not a warning at all. It's just part of this process. It's part of the initiation. Um, okay, the, the, one of the, one of the uh, motifs of opaque comes up here. Uh, the hearse driver seems to be absurdly tall, like he grows in front of him, like uh, because he's been drugged and he's been uh, overwhelmed by sensory detail, but also because it's a sort of Dracula initiation. I mean, he's going to Dracula's castle, and Dracula, remember, is all about uh, uh, is about Drino and stealing life essence. Uh, the vampirical energy is stealing you, the you, the innocence of life essence at the height of fear. Um, to increase life expectancy and to give one uh, dark powers. Um, he says, wouldn't it have been an, an enlightening resolution? He says, Friedland attempted to look out, but the windows were opa- opaque. He tried to open the windows on either side, but without success, and the glass partition between him and the coachman's box was just as opaque, just as firmly sealed. He knocked at the glass pane, shouted, screamed, and the coach rolled on. 
The sky was overcast. The clouds were scudding. The wind whistling, and Friedland found himself standing in the snow. Friedland, again, is Bill Hartford, the Tom Cruise, which emitted a faint radiance all about him. And as he stood there with his fur coat open over the monk's habit, the pilgrim's hat on his head, he felt a little eerie. He remembered that his appearance must be more than a little uncanny. He was in serious danger. The thought of the things that might at that very moment be taken taking place inside the villa filled him with horror, despair, shame, and fear. And he felt like he had a knife between his ribs. But he says, tomorrow is another day. And again, it crossed his mind that his body might already be carrying the seed of some fatal disease. Wasn't he perhaps lying at home in bed this very moment? Hadn't everything he believed he had experienced been nothing more than delirium? He tries to tell himself it was a dream and that he's in delirium because he's a doctor and because of something he got through that. Everything was fine. He's fully awake, he says. He's fully awake because now he's awake in terms of what he's been initiated into. Um, and then he goes home and he sees uh, he sees his wife, and his wife tells him this awful story that we get in the movie about being violated and that she's laughing in his face. Our clothes had disappeared. I was overcome by absolute horror, burning, all-consuming shame, and at the same time, anger against you as though you were responsible for this misfortune and all this horror, shame, and anger. Again, she, she has the same, she mimics the same feelings that he just had. Once you had disappeared, I felt totally at ease. I was neither sorry for you nor worried about you, but simply glad to be alone. And I ran happily across the meadow singing. And it was a tune from a dance we had listened to at that masked ball. <laughs> she was there, dude. Right? I could see this city, but I somehow knew what it was like. It lay there far below me and was surrounded by a high wall, an utterly fantastic and hard, hard to describe in words, not exactly oriental nor medieval. She's, she's, she is just recounting to him the same story that we just heard about him, but in parables. This is part of the initiation. To me, it was as though I had lived through innumerable days and nights, as though time and place no longer existed, and instead of the peaceful clearing surrounded by the woods and rock where I had once been before there was now an extensive flowery plain stretching in every direction as far as the horizon but whether there were three or ten or a thousand couples there beside myself whether I could see them and whether I gave myself to that man only or to others as well I couldn't say the sheer bliss I experienced in the dream there you stood your hands tied behind your back and all other couples in the unending tide of nakedness which surged around me uh you were standing in the courtyard. A young woman wearing a diadem and purple gown appeared at a high arched window between red curtains. That's his sacrifice, right? That was this. That was his redeemer. You were prepared to become my paramour, in which case your death sentence could be remitted. At this, you remain true to me unto all eternity. At this, the princess shrugged her shoulders and waved into the void, and they whipped you and chastised you. The blood flowed from you in streams, and. You greeted me with smiling eyes, carried out my wishes, felt tempted to laugh in your face with scorn, all because out of fidelity to me, Fidelio. So I burst out laughing as loudly and piercingly as I was able to, faithless, cruel, and treacherous, into sleep and oblivion. And there we are, lying side by side like mortal enemies. Now he's enemies with his wife, but they live to now. So he's so that is supposed to mimic. Hold on, man. Itch. Okay, I got it. <laughs> um, that is supposed to mimic <laughs> that your loved ones <clears throat> in this book and in the movie you they hate, and their new loved ones, the ones that they hate even more, are the ones they are closest to in their blackmailed uh, pyramid group. Um, he even mentions a kind of DID here. He says uh, the most, let's see, uh, reliable, he was a reliable, progressive doctor, this is page 80, a decent husband, family man, and father, and at the same time, a profligate, seducer, and cynic, who played with men and women at his, as his whim dictated. And the most agreeable thing of all about it was that later on, when Albertine imagined herself secure in the haven of her tranquil, conjugal, and family life, he would be able to smile coldly and confess his sins to her, and thus get even for all the bitterness and shame that she had brought upon him in her dreams. So, the part of the dream story is that his 
outer, his exterior actions are so dreamlike. They're so unbelievable that they mimic her interior dream life, and the two become uh, uh, un. You can't tell the difference between them, right? They, you, there's no differentiation between them, and they're just as bad as each other because they also both happen. Um, that's why at the end of the film, remember at the end of the film when they're standing in the toy store with bears all around, which is, by the way, like a weird, um, a weird, what do they call that, an Easter egg in the movies, a weird Easter egg for the, the creepy bear in The Shining, which is to say that The Shining... The things that happen at the Shining Hotel that Kubrick is exposing in the movie or whatever are the same things that we see in the ritual at the Our Child Mansion in Eyes Wide Shut. Right. That you are you are now eyes open, you are awake while you're asleep in the trauma novel. Trauma dream. And that um, one of the things that they say to each other when they're at the... Uh, when they're at the toy store, and and the daughter the daughter picks up like the Monopoly board and it's got the rich the magic circle ritual on it and then she goes and follows the the watchers, right the finders the finders are there. She goes off with the finders and they're sitting there talking for fucking fifteen minutes in the store and they're not even looking around, like where'd she go, dude? And one of the things that they say to each other as they reconcile in that scene is she's. She's like, he's like, so do you think that we can still be together? And she's like, yes, because the things that you did for one day out of the process of our whole marriage, um, it's just one day. And he says the thing about, yeah, just as just like your dreams are as real as the things that I did. And then then she ends with the, you know, the sex magic keyword uh, at the end of the movie. But it's crazy because. They're only reconciled because now they are reconciled to being initiates. She was already in it. I assume she was already in this thing. Um, she's a kind of, uh, what is she? She's a Lola Zaza or whatever in the cult, and he's been initiated, you know, by the Magister. But DID even comes up in the book on page 83. says, he remembered a number of remarkable cases of a double identity he knew from books on psychiatry. A person would disappear suddenly from a perfectly orderly milieu, be forgotten, and then return months or years later, unable to remember where he'd been for all that time. Afterwards, someone who had known him in some distant land would recognize him, yet the homecomer would know nothing about it whatsoever. And in a milder form, they were experienced by a great many people. What about when one awoke from dreams, for example? Of course, there one could remember, but there were also surly dreams, which one forgot completely, of which nothing remained but some mysterious aura some obscure bemusement, or else one remembered later, much later, and could no longer tell whether one had experienced something or merely dreamed it. Creep. Uh, yeah, we find out on page 87 uh, about the morphine OD. He meets with Adler, who is Ziegler in the film. Uh, Sidney Pollock. Sidney Pollock is, <laughs> again, Sidney Pollock is another one of these pawns used in the movie because Sidney Pollock is a sort of CIA director. We covered him with Condor and a bunch of those works. Um, I don't know if he was in, you know, if, if that's what that is, but uh, but he certainly is adjacent, right? Um, it seems to be the, he's perfectly cast in the movie um, for that role. Yeah, page um, 91, morphine poisoning in the second clinic that evening. It should now have been laid out down here. Uh, he meets the face of death and decay, a completely null, vacant face, the face of death. Um, and he starts to, like, fondle the figure of Domino who, or whomever in the morgue, and the guy says, what on earth are you doing? As if he is, as if it's decay, right? I mean, it's all death and decay and destruction and, um, and, uh, making lust with death, uh, sex magic Thelema ritual here. Um, and at the end of the book, I'm sure as I am of my sense that neither the reality of a single night nor even of a person's entire life can be equated with the full truth about his innermost being. So the innermost being is again shown in the book and the movie and with Faust by the fact that it is the exterior symbol or the mask that shows the innermost being that's hidden behind the veil of secrecy. 
and ritual initiation. So that's it. That's uh, Arthur Schnitzler's dream story or Trom novel. Uh, and Eyes Wide Shut by Stanley Kubrick, 1999, and Faust by uh, John Goethe. <laughs> so, um, so that's it. What'd you guys think? Um, please make sure you leave me a comment afterwards. Let me know what you think. Give me some other uh, Faustian adjacent um, works that you can think of. Some people left some good comments in the post that I put up. But also, of course, we think of um, the picture of Dorian Gray is another one of these instances. Slightly different. That's uh, that's making a deal, a bargain for a hellish existence in return for the exterior, um, you know, youthful physical beauty, which will decay in the flames of the fire that consumes the painting and the soul of um, of um, Dorian Gray at the end of the book. But there are a bunch of instances of this, of course. Uh, uh, Steppenwolf by Hesse covered this. Uh, Master and Margarita, right, was another example of this. So let me know what you guys think. Uh, let me get some super chats in real quick here. Yeah, shouts out again to Kristen for that five bucks on Cash App. Really appreciate you, Kristen. Thank you so much. You are the best. Um, if you want to support me, please like and share the stream. You guys help me get get out there. Um, and the likes are really important. Obviously, we all know that. The likes, how important the likes are for the algo. Leave a comment afterwards. Just put algo if you want. Right, Algo, boost, right, gang, gang, whatever you're going to put. Dr. Acula, that's right. Dr. Frank Einstein. Shouts out to Jason for that $10 PayPal. Thank you so much, Jason. Also, shouts out to, let's see, shouts out to uh, NP who dropped that 10 bucks. I think I gave a shout out for that last time. And to Thomas Henderson for that 25 bucks last time. I think I did, but I'm just making sure I covered it here. Um, yo, shouts out also to uh, to Edward the Third, who dropped that twenty bucks last time. Um, oh, that was between the Dune stream and this one. He said, "For I missed the last three to four live streams." Um, thank you so much, uh, Edward the Third. Thank you. That I really appreciate that. And shouts out to uh, Ethan, who's a big supporter here. He dropped ten bucks last time. Um, some other people have gotten to me in between. Thank you. Shouts out to uh, our good friend Daniel out there who dropped a hundred dollar super chat for me to cover cover some music, and I'm gonna do that soon. I'll be covering um, probably. What do you want me to cover? You want me to cover uh, the grunge movement? Want me to cover Alice in Chains or more Britpop? You want more? I've been listening to a lot of Morrissey, Suede Head. Um, some girls are bigger than others. Some girls are. On the Cleopatra as he opened the case of veil. Yeah, shouts out to uh, real John Connor out there. <laughs> Five bucks on Cash App for she had great pipes and lungs too. And lungs too. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, real John Connor. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. I've been listening to a lot of Ian Brown. Ian Brown. Ian Brown. Ian Brown from um, Stone Roses. Fantastic expectation. Fear. F E A R. You got the fear. F what does he say? Uh, finding everything and realizing. Yeah. Um. I listen to a lot of Ian Brown. I listen to a lot of of uh, Smiths over the past few years. Ian Brown was big for me because then he came out with an album in um, 2002 when I was in the UK and when I lived in Belfast and then in England. He was big. He had that song Fear and. Um, corpses in their mouths. I love Ian Brown, uh, and I love Oasis. Uh, Crystal, who was it? Crystalline said Soundgarden, SDP, or Supergroups. Yeah, it sounds good. We could do Black Hole Sun. We could cover some, um, and definitely STP. I love Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah. Um, am I a Joy Division fan? Yeah, I like a little. I like a little Joy Division, and I like uh, I like Hacienda music from Manchester. I, we, we should cover um, um. What's the movie with uh, Steve Coogan? Yeah, what, somebody, Toledo, are you here? You know the movie. What's the movie with Steve Coogan about Hacienda and Manchester, the Manchester scene and the Happy Mondays? Um, yo, DM Fuerte drops five bucks and says, what do you think of Young Goodman Brown as an inversion of Faust? Society enters the satanic bargain, but Brown opts out. I don't know. I got to go back to Young Goodman Brown, and then I'd have to go back to Ministers of Black Veil and De Devil and Daniel Webster and a lot of, especially a lot of American literature 
that um, is certainly a J. I think that's certainly true. Um, and I think that there's a there's an interesting uh, there's an interesting insight into the Faustian um, bargain that occurs at the in the pioneer people and the start of American literature, um, which it seems to be an awareness of this as far as uh, the perceived evil of the outside world, which is interesting because it, that is an inversion of the English Romantic period where we have the Cathedral of Nature. When we get to America, we see wilderness, or people saw wilderness as as this evil penetrating darkness uh, on the outside of the town. Um, so it's certainly that's certainly interesting. Thank you so much for that super chat. Let's see who else we got in here. Um, yeah, shouts out to Edward III there, five bucks about Damien uh, Eccles. And, um, yeah, that's your, says, third Super Chat on live stream. Thank you so much. Shouts out to Pim out there, big supporter, 10 bucks. The belief you can shortcut your way to greatness is illusions of grandeur. The shortest uh, path towards mastery is consistency. Good call, Pim. Excellent call. I think that, I think that that's certainly true. They're, 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 the shortcuts are interesting because it, it depends on what you mean by shortcut. I mean, when we have artists who... There's no shortcut except when one takes the shortcut through the circuitous route that they've already uh, established through consistency. So, for example, when you have a, a poet who breaks the rules, it works when they've already learned the rules. Unless we have specific artists who are very rare who seem to, as Harold Bloom says, material, like God materialized them and they never changed. There's very little change from the beginning to the to the end of their of, right or their opus. It's like with Rambo, um, a little bit with Shakespeare, um, uh, with Mozart. Mozart was like that. Rambo was like that. They they were brilliant from the beginning. They were like a divining rod, and they they never changed. They were always brilliant. But that's that's you know that's a a higher level of talent that's created. That's not that's that's not a shortcut. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that those people never, they died for their art. Um, they never took, sh there were no shortcuts cause that was their life. Um, yeah. Shouts out to that. Uh, shouts out to Ethan for that 10 bucks on cash app. Thank you so much. Mm, yes. For that nonstop fire. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And, um, and then five bucks from DM for So thanks. Thanks a bunch. Um, Special beings, really appreciate that. I love you all. Hope everybody's having a, a good March, right? A good March into April. Gosh. March seems to be shorter than February was. I don't know. They're all the, sort of the same, I guess, but, you know. Um, I will, uh, I, I, today I wrote an article for, I have my 20, I told you about this before. I have my 25th high school reunion coming up. And I wrote a, uh, and I wrote a, uh, yeah, Mozart was a Freemason, but he wasn't when he was five years old. I mean, you know. Um, and I wrote a, um, an article for that, which I'm pretty happy with. That I was thinking about reading to you guys. I think you would appreciate it. Uh, but I'm going to wait till it's published, and then I'll read it for you guys. And uh, also, again, one more time, it's been a tough week, because one more time, I want to say, uh, I want to say uh, rest in peace to uh, my old friend James out there who passed away. And again, he made, uh, he was an excellent musician, great music. And, you know, I just, I, I've been uh, ruminating on it this week, right? Um, because, you know, I, I, I let your life not be relegated to a social media post. You know, the things people, it's just crazy because when people, when you, when a person dies, I expect the world to stop for them. You know, but but we got to keep living and people make comments and say their things and say their praises, but it never seems to be enough. You know, um, your, your life is a, a full thing. And, uh, you know, one day we'll all be gone um, and, you know, we'll be in the hopefully be in the memories of our loved ones and, and people and things that we things that we created. We got to create. We got to we got to got to make stuff. You know, we got to write stuff or make art or make music or build houses or, you know, whatever you do, you got to make stuff out there. I don't, you know, is what I think. I'm just some dude. But, uh, but anyway, so I've been thinking about that a lot. And, um, 
And let me know in the comments afterwards again what you think about, uh, you know, the Faustine bargain and all those people um, and other works, other works of art, other works of literature and film that you come into contact with. Uh, go and see, go and see some movies. Go and see Dune too. Um, read some books, and um, I'll be coming back soon with. Uh, I guess probably I'm going to start on the Brad Easton Ellis book next and i've got a bunch of sponsor streams to do we'll do the music streams we'll do franz kafka's the trial uh i'll be covering some stuff with jamie and again um get me on um view says speak for yourself bla wow what i say yeah i i do speak for myself of course that's i only speak for myself i'm not speaking for anybody else of course when have i ever spoken for anybody else i'm speaking for myself um <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, so look, I'll be on uh, Jim Bob's channel on Friday for uh, a little bit of that panel, and then I will be on uh, TNT Radio Live at 7.40 Eastern Time with Hesher. And um, shouts out to everybody out there. <laughs> shouts out to everybody out there. I love y'all. I, I hope you have a good good night. And um, let's uh, listen. Let's take it away. Let's take it away. Here's Sting and to cut off his new album. All right. Peace.
Oh, my God.